you're tuning in to Pastar Prime, a show powered by Squad Locker. Here are your hosts, retired Astros minor league star Tip Fairchild and former Patriots All-Pro Center, Dan Copen. Pastar Prime, he's Tip, I'm Dan, coming at you. Episode 19. And... Boy, have we got got we have, we we have one for you today. If you haven't listened to any episodes yet, you're just you I just mean, listen to this. All one. eight to ten of you out there, you want to get motivated, you want to get fired up. We just had David Rutt Rutherford on. Rutt, I love Rutt. He's been podcasting forever. You know, Frog Logic is his he, thing. He's a Navy SEAL. He's a former. Still a Navy SEAL. For what those guys do, they can oh, have that title. For, you have it forever. For, forever. I tattoo it right on my like neck. Um, we have him on the interview. You can find him at Team Team Frog Frog Logic. Frog Logic. Yep. Um, we're gonna talk to him. We're moving up in the world. We have a live read to get to as well. Getting fancy in here. Oh, we got an ad. It's amazing what's happening right now. But I will tell you that I've I was ready to run through a wall twenty times during this Honestly, interview. Honestly, that's why that's actually why I don't want to talk to you right now because I'd actually I just we rather sound dumb. Hey, we sound so dumb right now because he's so smart. He's and, so like, he was using these words, his hand motions. Like, so the YouTubers out there, they're going to watch on YouTube. It's like I actually learned some by, like, how he was going when he was doing this thing, Dan, like, to the to the point and then the thing after. I was like, oh, my God. I just can't pronounce what the words <laughs> I don't know what using. any of the words yeah. were. Remedi- <laughs> remediation. There was a lot of words in there. But they were, I, I mean, I was, I, I wasn't. I don't. I wasn't glazed over. I was like my eyes were burning because I was trying to like pay attention so hard, so I knew what was going on. It was unbelievable. No, there's not. I, we I, we could have spent five hours. We will spend five hours with him. At that's some a good. Point. That, that, that I'm looking forward to. That. Yeah, that, that, that's a good thing. But it, I mean, what he what he's been through, what he's gone through, um, what he is still going through, but how that how that mindset of the SEALs teams and the military really apply across all sports. Yeah. Um, and businesses, um, they're you know, the men- highest functioning team. The mentality in the world. that you have, um, you know, he just he just offered some great in- insights. Tons, and, um, boy, tons. That was awesome. Uh, tons, I mean, and he's so he's done. He's a corporate trainer too, and like motivational speaker. So he talks to you know he's he's worked with the Red Sox for multiple years. He's worked with you know big companies, large companies, Fortune five hundred companies, and training their sales staffs and everything. Talking about fear and talking about conf- self confidence and you know, team life and everything. And it, he can, he can deliver it. No, yeah. I'd, I'd go out there and hire him come in and talk. We right are now. probably about to. All right. So <laughs> before we get to that, cause it won't be long, you know, we, we talked to him for, for a while. Oh, we got an it, hour. It, it, I think we got an hour. 50. This will be our longest episode, Max. And I love that because <laughs> it was strong. It was good. very strong. I owe you a hundred dollars. You do. Um, just on, just to update the bet. Yep. I lost the Masters pool, but I will say again, I did pick the winner again. <laughs> pick the winner I, twice, but two we years forgot. in a row, I got the goddamn winner. Yeah, we forgot though about the stipulation that we talked about on one of the episodes that said, "Hey, we got to do something if you pick the winner." <laughs> we forgot to do that. Win Completely the bet. forgot. So Dan so, picked the winner, but I won the bet. So win for me. There was there was um, a little bit because it, it, it was it, you pick six from six golfers from six different tiers. Uh, not ne- not necessarily in ranking order, world ranking, but six golfers. You pick six. I thought it was four. Yeah, it was five. It was five. It so five. the goal of this tournament, easy office pools, basically, was to pick guys that make the cut. Make and the I'm cut. blaming my loss. I yeah. wouldn't have won it anyway. But I'm blaming my loss on Dustin Johnson. I had you're the too, number. Though. I know you did. I know, but I'm just. Uh, I know it was. You you're the number make the cut. one. You're the number one goddamn player in the world. Yeah, you gotta make You've the cut. You've got to make the cut. You gotta make Jason the cut. Jason Day, you know, usually plays there. If you miss the cut, I'm not shocked. Sun J M was. Yeah. I think he finished last. That was it my was, worst. That was my <laughs> he broke his putter was, one day. It was, it was awful. Yeah, you, and then if you miss the cut, then you get like straight eighties for the next two rounds, and then yeah. you're just it was just it's, it was it's a such mess. a great. Four but you days, did well. Though. You yeah, did I well. Finished fifth or sixth, I think, in the overall pool without my number one guy even making the cut. Is that the only so, guy you had miss? Yeah. See, that's, yeah, everybody that's, else that's made you, it. Got to make the cut. Um, you know what a great four days though. I love the four days, and then and then yesterday we get an Instagram post uh, or well, really some Twitter. Magic first uh, about Edelman. Yeah, retiring. Uh, hey, you know, is that a real retirement? 
That looked <laughs> just by the Twitter post or Instagram, whatever it was, it looked real. No, I, it I was, mean, he did a video at it was Gillette. Very, I very, mean, it, it was, was a big production. Yeah, there was a lot maybe going Maybe a on. little bit too much. A little of a, over, <laughs> maybe a little overproduced. Uh, I was wondering I was maybe, wondering where Dan was going to go on like this. How, how, many, how, much, how many times do you want to take a look at the stadium and just like It was a, a lot around the stadium. Yeah, it, it was, was a big a circle. Deep thought by half Jack minutes. Handy right there. Yeah, three and a half minutes. But it was, it was, but. All kidding aside, for that guy yeah. to go from Kent State, which is a division program, smaller school, mm-hmm. not to say you can't make it. Obviously, that's not the yeah. case. Playing quarterback. Mm-hmm. At, in high school and in college, coming in to the pros, coming in with New England, waiting his time, changing position, changing his body type. Yeah. And just to have the career that he had, not only in the regular season, but how many big catches that he came up in the postseason and championship games. Tons. Uh, that guy. Go-to guy for you know, 12 th- for that, a while. That's one of those people where, mm-hmm. you know, 99 coaches are going to say, nope, I don't want you. Mm-hmm. And it just mm-hmm. takes that one just to, hey. I I see something in you. Yep. You've got it. You've got that work ethic. You've got that drive. Um, so twelve years to him. Phenomenal career. Yep. Congratulations. Enjoy retirement. I'm sure he will be very overly produced in his uh, in yeah. his in his future endeavors. Will you will you see him at the at any events coming up? In the future, or? I don't know. I don't know. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> He's got enough time on his hands uh, if it happens. Okay. okay. If something happens. All right. We'll we'll see. That I'll, I'll, I'll keep a future that. episode. It might be future episode. I, I will. I will have more information on what you're referring to mm-hmm. at a future show. Maybe okay. episode twenty. Maybe twenty one. All right. So stay tuned for that. No teaser right but, there. Max. But but it can't get past episode twenty two. So if you can do week do by week, do the math. You can yeah. figure out what might be in that area. There you go. That's a good way to Which put it. Is a, Let yeah. people hunt. Yeah. Let people go hunt for the. Uh, we need to have. We, let's restrict our viewers and listeners. <laughs> what do you think about him? Is he? Oh, how, I, far, how far up is he on your list? He's up there quite a way. Just because it, it was the whole second run of Super Bowls. You know, like, so you got, like, the whole first wave of Super Bowls. I mean, there's only one guy that's been around for both of the waves. But there was, you know, the Welkers of the world, the Troy Browns of the world. Welker was in that middle. Right. Welker was right. He didn't get one. Welker didn't get one. That's right. Right. So even before that, Troy Brown then. So it's probably Troy Brown, like, in the beginning. Troy, David Patton, Givens. Yep. Yep. uh, Branch. Right. Right. But it was, I saw a hilarious Bill Belichick and... Uh, Wes Welker video, oh, I saw, yeah, the Wally Pip thing, Wally Pip. where Edelman runs back the kick, and he's like, "You ever heard of Wally Pip?" Because Welker was hurt, and he's like, "No," and he's like, "Go read about him." Yeah, no, <laughs> basically that's like Welker. What like, happened? Welker kind of looked bad in that video, yeah. but I think he just looked bad. One, maybe he couldn't hear what Bill was saying. Right, right. And the other thing is maybe he didn't know who Wally Pip was. He didn't. Because so he, he said, just like, kept, no, I don't know what you're talking there, about. He just kept sitting there, like, smiling and laughing. Yeah, he's and like, oh, yeah, he's oh, a yeah. great guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah that, so Lou Gehrig came in and played 2,300 games yes. when Wally Pip was sick one day. It's a fantastic trivia yeah. question. Yeah, who is, is great. Who is the guy that Lou Gehrig replaced? Yeah, Wally Pip. Um, so, who, anyway, so what's this? Welker never got one. You know what? The, the, the one guy yeah. that never got one that I feel like should have got Logan Mankins. Didn't get one. He never. He didn't. He, got I, paid. I though. don't want to say never. Oh, he did. He did get paid. Got paid. But he came in in oh three oh five was his first year, mm-hmm. and he left in two thousand thirteen. So right before right, right the, before the yeah. fourteen season, I think. Yeah. So he was in that middle thing. One of the greatest mm. linemen the Patriots have ever seen, next to John Hanna, probably. Yep. So congrats, great, to that great, man. great career, Hall of Fame caliber yeah. career. Just never got one. Didn't get one. So congrats, Edelman. I mean, great career. So now I'm wondering how the Pats and now the Pats. The whole thing's kind of moved on now. Now it's like a whole new group almost. All a lot of people aren't there anymore, except for our, except for Belichick. Belichick Slater. Yeah. Slater's been there a while. Yeah, that's true. Slater and McCourty. Would you still? Or he's in that middle wave. Middle. He's still in middle. the middle, but it, there's no. Yeah. yeah, Edelman was probably in that middle wave too, yeah. right? But I mean, it's it's <laughs> it just all, a new regime. <laughs> Ever since Tommy left, you got. I, I, I'm a Tampa Bay fan as of right now. <laughs> no, I can't do that. I'm definitely after a Pats After they spent fan. that much money? Yeah, I'm a Pats fan. I'm ready to get after this season. We get $15 million on the cap right now, too, because Edelman's gone, so there's some money available now. Look so at you. I, I know. I, cap wait, Anything wait. else? I, um, I got this piece of paper here. We got a library. So uh, from our marketing team. And this is. We're getting an ad. This is bef- we're going to do this before rut. 
We're going to do this before We're going to do this. We're going to do this as kind of like. A lead in to Rob. A lead in. A little live before, before the interview. Guests, yes. I want to talk directly to all the youth sports leaders out there. We're going off script, though, because I'm not going to read the rest of this. <laughs> so sorry, marketing team. But Dan and I, you know, we're here at Squad Locker. We want to help people, you know, that have, uh, they, have they ever had to try to replace a jersey before for a kid that's on their team? Have they ever had a kid that missed the ordering window? And now all of a sudden you get the kid that's wearing the small jersey that's the big kid or the kid that's the small kid that's wearing the huge jersey. Or maybe he's got a long, uh, right? wrong last name on his back. Ooh, wrong last name. All those things. Hey, uh, Squad Locker's here to change the game for you, Dan. I see you keep looking down. I look down at the notes on that one. I did. I did. (laughs) Because we actually have a landing page for this that we're going to rattle off right now. But we have custom online stores. You can offer a mix of custom sublimated, printed, and embroidered uniforms. I would call that a triple play if I was going to call that something. Um, One more would be a Grand Slam. We have to figure out one more. Grand Slam. But a Grand Grand Slam. Slam. We need four in there. You're right. Team gear, spirit wear, uniforms, all in one spot. Stores are always open, which is wild. We can serve coaches, players, parents, fans directly and on demand, Max. So that means you buy something, it ships. We don't wait till for it to process and batch, and there's no order minimums, which is wild. And actually, there is one. Well, you have to order one. That order is one. correct. You actually which have you, to which transact. You, which you can't do anywhere else. So That's you might true. As well do That's here. very true, Dan. So check out. This is a big part here. This is our first real ad thing here, Max. Check out squadlocker.com slash suit up s-u-i-t-u-p to learn more and now on to the interview guest today david rutherford really cool guest here today giddy up giddy up giddy up 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 giddy up giddy up giddy up up giddy up giddy up giddy up 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 giddy up giddy up up see that's how you bring the energy known as the hand grenade of positivity wow i love that the hand grenade of positivity max you hear that so i mean a a a corporate trainer a like just speak motivational speaker to like high performing teams and not to mention dan and we've been wanting to talk to one of these guys a navy seal yes so uh, once this, once a Navy SEAL, always a Navy SEAL, right? Is that how it works or is Man, it? Man, you know, I, I think when you get into that context where, you know, Marines will be like, I'm still a Marine and all that, mm-hmm. you know, those crayon eaters, they, they get a little bit intense with it. I, I don't, I'm not going to freak out if you say former Navy SEAL or anything like that. I mean. Do you guys get bent out of shape when someone says, uh, uh, hey, man, former NFL, yeah, yeah. former MLB? It, it's just like, you know, it is what it is. And I, I'm just proud to have been part of the the unit in whatever context yeah. it means. That's awesome. Yeah. So we met we met through through your fiance. We've been trying to go to your wedding now for a while. We've actually <laughs> had three, we've had three trips planned down to your area that we've had to cancel. This is all during COVID. So the very first trip we were going down to see them, then it got canceled. We were going again, got canceled. It just keeps on happening, but it'll happen eventually. I hope but, so, man, because we're ready for you guys yeah, down here. Was, so we met with with David's fiance, and then my and my wife were played division one field hockey together mm-hmm. and then i play a golf tournament one weekend or one week i guess maybe last summer two summers ago mm-hmm. i think i go up to new hampshire because the my wife's family had a house in new hampshire and i walk through the door and there's this guy sitting here long hair you know tat- do you have long hair right now is it tucked under the no, hat no no shaved, I shaved it down it oh. he's getting ready but for the I, wedding i started yeah. looking like a homeless person and, and <laughs> it was just like yeah. john was like okay i got enough yeah now. time to like, time right. to cut it so he's sitting at the table, long hair, got the tattoos. I heard he was a Navy SEAL. I was like, geez, I got to be like careful going in there. This guy can beat me up. <laughs> you know? Like I'm going to a lot of places where I'm like the guy that's like, I'm, I'm nervous about You're like going into the happen. room with your, old, your chest yeah. all pumped up. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. I did push ups in the walked in like yeah. this. Yeah. Let's see what this I, guy's got. <laughs> yeah. I, I did push ups in the driveway for an hour before I came in. And, and then I watched a video on how to do like Kung Fu, you know, just in case. <laughs> So oh, I go I in, we sit down at the table, we drank, I think, a bottle of, a whole bottle of McAllen 18 or something. It was delicious. Whatever we did, we drank a whole bottle and went to bed at 4 a.m. Well, well, you forgot also, you you primarily mm-hmm. and the rest of us contributed somewhat, uh, ended off one of those giant vats of cheese puffs. Oh, which yes. I, never, oh, I have absolutely. never seen a cheese <laughs> he puff said me that, primarily. That, yeah, right, right. And, and, you yeah. know what's amazing is he was at the house the other day, and we had one of those giant vats, and he looked at it, and his eyes just widened. Oh, I love He's those like, you things. don't understand how much I love these things. 
they're tremendous. It, it's more than a phenomenon, I think. I mean, it, it's something deeper than that with Tip. But I, it was impressive. <laughs> but I, I got to tell you, man, the entertainment of of that evening was off the charts. So you, you remember, mm-hmm. I, I never meet. I'm trying to put my best foot forward with Jana and her yep. her closest collegiate friends, and and you know they've known each other for years. And I'm like, all right, don't be an asshole. Don't say anything <laughs> stupid. You know, whatever. And 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 all of a sudden now it, it just turns into this just complete debauchery of mm-hmm. busting on each other and i was just like i love these people yeah, i'll you're fit in. right in I'll- yeah you're in <laughs> did, did she accept that i mean i like we talk sometimes and we've been a part of teams we've been in the locker room where we do go back and forth with one another mm-hmm. after that night though did jana like say hey you were kind of an asshole a little bit or did she just think you just fit no, into the group it's right? the ball, ball busting right but still hey no, it happens no, sometimes no, people I mean, don't get that stuff I, I, a lot of people don't. And I, I'm, I'll admit I'm one of them, man. I grew up in, in Boca Raton, Florida. I I didn't, my older brother was gone long before I, I didn't really understand that kind of humor. And then I get to Penn state where I played lacrosse and, and uh, you know, my roommate was from Baltimore and like the inner city of Baltimore and within seconds, man, everything is busting chops. And, and I'm just like, after like two months, I'm like, Hey man, why are you always such an ass? Why, why can't you just, and he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, he's like, I'm just kidding with you. And I was like, yeah, but it's all day, every day. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I had the thinnest skin, but thankfully due to, due to my buddies who from Philly that I played with my buddies from Baltimore, my buddies from long Island, they prepared me for what ended up being the most intense, uh, um, regimen of of peer let's call it peer evaluation that i ever experienced which was the seal teams and then that yep. was like nothing uh, you can even fathom because if it, it always goes too far <laughs> yeah so with with that night you know we go to bed at four o'clock in the morning after i mean i think it was a couple bottles by the way but i remember one of the bottles being expensive and being like we're gonna drain this thing let's do it so <laughs> we go to bed and then i remember going to bed and going i'm waking up before this guy <laughs> So, so I was like, this is a Navy. I'm like, oh man, you see all these things, you see the movies, you hear all the stories and everything. I'm like, I bet he's up at five 30. He's going to be outside, like running down the road with like rocks in his hands or something. So I go to bed and I set my alarm for like five 24. I wake up, I go down and make coffee. I'm like, put on like workout clothes to like be like, man, maybe I'll work out. Maybe I won't, but at least I woke up. He, woke, got up at, it, he, it, woke, he woke up at 1030. He came, oh yeah, down, the easily. Stairs. He came yeah. down the stairs at 1030. So I was like, all right, I guess they don't, there is like, I'm stereotyping a little too much here. He can wake up at a normal hour, I guess, or a, well, or a, uh, hey, I'm hungover. has blown this, this thing completely out of the water, right? This whole 430 on your watch, get up, get going. Yeah. 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 That's, that's legit in the teams. And when you're working and especially in training, there's no doubt. I mean, every day was a four o'clock day. But man, I, I'm almost 50 years old. If I don't get nine hours, man, with my <laughs> operator syndrome, my TBI, and all my other stuff, man, yep. I'm I'm useless throughout most of the day. So sleep has has become uh, my number one form of recovery, and, and absolutely, I'm lost within my world. Otherwise, I just can't function here. Got it. Let's get Got back. It. Let's get to the four four o'clock time because. W- what made you after lacrosse at Penn State? What made you? Did you was it the seals or nothing, or you just wanted to go into the military? No, it was the seals or nothing. My, you know, my my dream was to play football at a D one level. Uh, did a, you know, after coming out of high school down here, we were zero and ten, worst team in my, you know, team's history. Did a fifth grade, a postgraduate year up in Connecticut at Choate. Hat. We won New England big school prep school champions, but I ended up splitting time with a, a quarterback who ended up going to UPenn and playing there and a guy named Mike Gerber, really phenomenal athlete, but he was a, 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 a running quarterback and I was passing. So we split. So I only had half this, the, the, the stats, but I was good enough to get recruited to play foot, you know, lacrosse. And I figured I'd walk on, but when I got to Penn state, the, the freshman quarterback was Kerry Collins. Mm. And, and as you guys mm. know, he's, he's a, He's just a phenomenon. I mean, he's got an 80 yard ball on a three step drop and, right. and, and I, he's six, five, two fifty five as a freshman. And it was just like, I realized, wow, this is beyond me. I, I don't have the physicality. Just my release point alone was at like six, two and a half. And that year, the average size of the line was six, eight, 300 pounds. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I'm definitely Throw not as fast the, as Doug Flutie, back right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I in that moment, I crashed. And for the next four years, really battled some issues with depression and, and some alcohol challenges and, and, and just really just caved in. And so when I finally had my epiphany in my, my senior year in April of 95, I had nowhere else to go. I was just at the bottom. And I said, well, I have to change my life dramatically. And I had read a book uh, that my next door neighbor as a freshman had given me about Vietnam SEALs. And I never knew about Viet- SEALs. I, I knew a lot about SF and Rangers from growing up. And um, But when I read this book, there was just something unique about the way they talked about team. And team was the essence of all success and all failure. And there was no individualism promulgated throughout any of the core uh, ideology that that filters throughout our culture. And so I, I read this and I'm like, that's what I need because all my, accept, my my successes in my life have all been relative to the teams I was on. And it wasn't, you know, whether I was on, a, a, you know, multiple state champions or, you know, zero and zero oh and 10 teams or whatever it was in between. It was just being a part of a, a, a team where that camaraderie, that 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 friendship, that support was kind of, you know, in my DNA. And so I figured the only place I could pull myself out of that abyss was to go to the most intense team that is out there in the military, which essentially I believed was the SEAL teams. And that's why I made the choice right from the get-go. The, when you look at any team, I mean, and you talk about like, Dan, I mean, Dan was on, you know, I guess we'll call him is eighteen and one. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I don't like bringing this up. I don't like to I mean, bring that up. I don't want to bring it up. But I was I on, was on some different but very good yeah, teams. So you've got two Super Bowl rings. You were on Huge. some incredible teams. Like and that one didn't win Super Bowl. But that, I would still consider that the best team maybe ever. Right. I'm not going to say anything. Okay, so I think it's let's the just, best team. I can let's, let's, right. yeah. Thank, let's just get back so, to a run. Let's, no, no, let's no. Look I'm just that. telling. I'm just. I'm leading in. So you lead into the question, Dan. <laughs> so like some of the best teams, right? Still you know, I, I played on some decent teams and stuff, but mostly minor leagues, like through college and everything. But nothing performs like a better team than the Seals. That's all you ever hear. Like you can be. Is that right or is that wrong? Like that's the h- highest performing unit ever, right? Like the way yeah. that you guys do it, or I what mean, do you think? It really is dependent upon the collective of guys. Yes, over the threshold of in, in size comparison, yeah, I think we have performed pretty significantly. I think we're we're, we're one of the top most decorated units uh, in the last twenty years of the War on Terror by far. You know, we've had now uh, three Medal of Honor winners within recipients, sorry, mm-hmm. uh, within the last 20 years, I don't even know how many brown bronze stars. Most of my friends that uh, have gone on have, you know, multiple, perp, uh, 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 which we call it, um, bronze stars with valor. I have one friend that has two silver stars, five bronze stars, two purple hearts. I mean, has over 450 combat missions. So yeah, there, I think you, there, you, there's an argument that can be made, but there are certainly a profound amount of, of Delta operators that are incredible, mm. TFO operators, uh, uh, ODA teams that have been incredible. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it's like any team, it's, it's the, the right place, the right mission, and most importantly, the right leadership. Mm-hmm. Got it. So there's a chart that I draw in here. I think this is a SEAL thing. I learned it from Simon Sinek. Is it Simon Sinek, mm-hmm. one of the speakers? So he draws an X, Y axis, and then he has uh, trust and performance mm-hmm. as the, the as the two, you know, X and Y axis. And the SEALs, I guess this is like part of his thing, and I try to talk about it all the time here with our sales group, is you don't want the high performer that's low trust, but you would take the person that was a low performer but high trust. And his thing was like, I could trust you with my – I could trust them with my life, but I wouldn't trust them with my money and my wife or like some quote that he says, like in the thing. But I see, think that it's so true because they say, Hey, if you, if you find that person, that's like a super performer, but people don't trust them. You just found like the asshole in the group almost every time where if you find somebody who you can trust all the time, but they don't always get it done at like the best highest level, but you trust them all the time. That's the person that you pick more often than not. And like he said, he said that's kind of how like SEAL teams are put together. It might not be the person who's like 
six five, perfectly fit, runs the fastest mile, can like bench the most, but it's the person that you're like, I'm going to battle with this person no matter what because they got my back. Is that is that pretty true? Is that like the <laughs> not the creed because you guys have a killer creed, but right. is that the is that like the is that what you're they're looking for? You know when they're selecting these things. I I think yeah I think you're we're definitely fixated on personality traits more than we're fixated on 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 skill sets for sure. I mean I I don't even know. I mean I, I remember uh, when I was in training and I was in training for 15 months, right? Um, I needed double the time to, to knock the hippie out of me from college, right? Because I was an art major with a minor in poetry. So I, I am a hippie who can kill you and then draw a picture of your dead body, right? So, you know, the, the idea is that we're searching for those personality traits and then the aptitude to be able to to teach the skill sets app because our skill sets are, are pretty stringent, right? Just like you guys, right? You are not going to be on a major league mound if you can't do X, Y, and Z. You are not going to step foot on an NFL field unless you can perform X, Y, and Z. The same goes for us, right? If you mm. cannot shoot, move, communicate, uh, handle the pressure, then you're simply not going. So we're 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 searching for the aptitude, the personality, um, and then what we often find is that you know these young people, these young men coming in, uh, who who submit to the program fastest. Um, uh, open up a space uh, where leadership can can begin to develop within them. And in and, and the context of our leadership is about being, earning the trust of the guy who's next to you, because that's everything. I mean, mm-hmm. Tip, you nailed the, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the nail on the head. If, if there's one second where I'm getting ready to, you know, I'm looking over or I'm not, and I'm staring at a door handle and I, and I do my little, you know, muzzle nod to I'm going in. And if this guy is, you know, doesn't respond or give me the squeeze or has the look of terror in his eyes, that's going to create doubt in me, which is going to potentially get us both killed. Mm -hmm, And, mm -hmm. and so that is, yes, that is the number one thing that we're looking for is that, that that semblance of 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 dire trust uh, within the other person because uh, you know when your life's on the line man uh if if it's not there it it makes things very difficult where does right. that start with you guys does it start with buds and you know i i think the the the, the fallout rate basically for buds is like 75 percent, which isn't do you guys higher than that Oh about 80, 80, 85, 86, right around there. I mean, there. you're looking to mm-hmm. your right and the left and the guy over there as well. You know, those guys aren't going to be there. And they're just probably, I know they're putting you through conditioning, all the training that's out. Are they just trying to push you to the mental limits to t- try and get you guys to break and, you know, see how you perform under those circumstances? And is that where that bond, you know, develops? Uh, 100%. I, I believe it, 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 it exists even before that. Right. Just like, remember that first, you know, that first moment in your career. And if you guys are anything like me, you you started at three or four years old, right? You had a ball in your hand, Mm -hmm. you were playing T-ball, you're playing flag tag, you know, and then it's Pop Warner and then it's Little League. And then, it, you know, and, and it's that 13, 14, 15, where you're like, man, I think I might want to just get on my BMX bike and hang out. But but what you realized you gained from it was so much more critical and felt so much better than, than you know, the, the transitory feeling of just, you know, having fun. There's something about winning that, that gets in your system and something about being a part of a team that's winning. So I, I think it's, it's innate in the individual or imbued in the development of their character through uh, whatever groups they're a part of prior to. What we do is – is we strip all of that down to its bare components, right? And and this is what I do with any private coaching client or whatever whatever team I'm working about working with. You know w- what we want to do is get down to the 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 core character trait of the individual and how that individual relates with other people, right? And 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 it's really a unique space. I mean and. And so what we do is we, every day is about failure all day, every day. Mm-hmm. Whereas in a lot of other uh, sport development program, player development programs, you, you know, you want the individual to experience the failure, but you're really through the repetition, you're, you're finding that, that ability through muscle, me- muscle memory, as well as confidence, you know, building to where you can perform the skill set under duress 
in the exact way you need to again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And then you make the micro adjustments based on the particulars of the sequence of the event itself. Mm -hmm. Well, with us, man, it's, it's no, we're going to pummel you. We're going to break you. Even if you're succeeding every day, they're still going to break you. They're still going to knock you back. And it's the person that, that they see mentally because everybody breaks, everybody collapses mentally, but then who are the people that are going to go over to the individual, pull them back in? And then how fast do they, you know, when they bottom out, do they begin their recovery back to a level of baseline performance that's adequate to pass the program? Mm -hmm. And so you really have to begin. And the instructors are to all the buds instructors out there, man, that I had and all the ones, the guys that I know that became buds instructor, man, hats off to you because you know, what they've been able to produce essentially is, you know, a unit that is attributed or is contributed along with the other SOCOM units to about 85, 90% of the operational workload over the last 20 years. Never before in our nation's history have we had that extended period. I mean, there are certain guys at the tier one units that have over a thousand combat missions. Now that's a phenomenon. Uh, that's a from the human mind uh, to the human heart to the phys the physical nature of the human experience. It's a phenomenon that they can keep going under that duress, and I believe it's attributable to what you learn through our program. The program itself is pushing the individual to the ultimate submission point where you release everything you knew prior to that point. You give up on, on the, your stranglehold on what you think you know is true about your capabilities and your limitations. You release it. You put your full unabrided trust in the program and then in your instructors. And then you just, you, you just skyrocket in terms of performance. I'm ready to run through a wall. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Are you ready to go no, through a wall? I, it's like, I, there's no comparison to what these guys go through and then, no. you know, to the athletic field, but it's, you can draw so many comparisons through the coaching or the instructors oh, yeah. of buds and you know what i went through on an inv individual you know basis every day with belichick i mean it's just right it's right. like you said it's like you want to put those guys in those pressure situations the only way to do that is in practice mm -hmm. and you want to practice those critical situations at the end of practice when everybody's tired yeah that's why we were able to go out there on sundays and perform in those critical situations so no, absolutely it's uh Dan, it's incredible. one of the greatest experiences i had you know so far in in, in my career in terms of uh, motivational performance coaching is you know my tenure with the red Sox for three years leading up to the world series championship mm -hmm. and and in 18 i got to know tony la Russa. and you know he's, he's good really with close Bill, yeah. with with coach belichick yep. and we would sit down and and i would just be pummeling him on how do you get Jose Canseco and Mark McGuire to work together? How do you mm -hmm. get Ricky Henderson and yeah. Dennis Eckersley to see eye to eye or Dave Parker or whatever? How do you get these wild personalities to, to come to some type of confluence and work together in a team, especially within baseball where it is such a unique individual right. uh, perspective. Right. Yep. And, and he's, and immediately he goes right to Belichick and he, and he talks about the, the ideologies behind that exact idea, putting people into a situation that somehow uh, reverberates uh, um, um, the realities of what they might face in that condition. And that's what we do. We train like it's real mm -hmm. and we do it over and over and over and over and over again. People, you, you know, you know tip you ask mm -hmm. why, why are C Good we do because we train non ever ends. You know, you spend a year and a half in what's called a workup, you know, a, a six month period of pro dev where you go get specialized skills, you become a sniper or a calm guy or medic or whatever. Then you have a year long training within your platoon uh, where you, you hit every spectrum of what you might encounter all the proficiency tactics, techniques, and procedures that you might have to uh, embark on downrange. And you become, you know, as a collective unit, uh, really proficient within close quarter combat, uh, maritime interdiction, whatever it might be. And then you deploy for that six months to eight, nine months, depending upon extensions. And, and you hone in on those skills. But if you go overseas and you're not prepared, you guys know the deal. If you step on the mound tip mm -hmm. and you haven't thrown enough pitches to where your arm is in that space that gives you the confidence to know the pitcher, to be able to, to deliver what you need to, when you need to, then you're done. You're mm -hmm. not going to have it. 
And so for us, it, it's all about that concept, Dan, of, of just training and training mm-hmm. and rehearsals and rehearsals to where when you are now confronted with that existential reality of, of your own death or, or worse, getting someone else killed or, or having to kill someone else, you're, you're, you're able to compartmentalize all of that emotional intelligence and shrink it down to where it's, 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 it's nominal at best. And then, then, you know, the, the, the simple behavioral cognition that's required to, to uh, enact those fine motor skills in, in, in real time and mm-hmm. under extreme mm-hmm. duress, you don't think about it. it becomes a moot point, right. Or uh, it becomes rote. Yep. I have that dream once a month, by the way, of not being ready to go pitch in a game <laughs> and then like no waking way. up. At, yeah, that's, that's awesome. A, it's a weird dream where it's like I didn't get ready for spring training. And I think a lot of people talk about that dream where it's like they go to class and they didn't go to class all semester and like they find out they failed or they have to take a test. But that's mine. Mine's like, oh, you didn't get ready for you didn't get ready. Like your arm's not right, but you got to go do it anyway. And it's like, oh, this isn't going to go well. So that dream pops up quite a bit for me. That, that's uh, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's yeah, actually it's, it, Chip, yeah. what's interesting is I, 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 I'm, I try and always work with a, a few uh, collegiate players mm-hmm. right now. And I'm working with a guy from the Penn State men's lacrosse team. And then I'm working for a young pitcher uh, down at a Texas team. And the, they're feeling the same things. They're mm-hmm. literally suggesting that they're having these ruminations uh, that are about their failure. And mm-hmm. so, you know, what happens is, is the subtle controls that a player needs to be able to have to recognize, you know, that's a, con- that's a natural construct of, of, of self-doubt. And that's why one of the major focuses I, I, I concentrate at after, after teaching young guys how to really uh, embrace their fear is the next focus on self-confidence and how you build that self-confidence day in and day out in the face of, of whatever adversity you're facing, whether it's, you know, those, those little micro tears, the nagging injuries, or it's something catastrophic, or it's, it's, you know, someone beats you out and it's a, you know, you believe it's a political or he likes him better or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. all those little head games that go on. And so what I really try and focus on is look, you, you can control these things. Do not allow your self-confidence to be, to, to be tied to anything out of your control period. Because the one thing in our worlds that, that, is is undisputable and I'll, I'll take Pepsi challenge with anybody else out there in this is that <laughs> it is a pure meritocracy right the best will play mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. there are extenuating c- circumstances like you alluded to in the beginning that if a person is a, is a head case and is not a team oriented player that there's a probability they might be taken out but there's also how many guys do we know that you guys have played with that were complete idiots who got on the field anyways, because they were so fricking good at what they did. Absolutely. You know? And so that's, that's a, that's an interesting point that you have to uh, kind of conceptualize is, is what is your self-confidence tied to? What about most? I might need 45 minutes a week with him on Wednesdays just to lay, I'll lay on my couch and we can talk like this. (laughs) 52 weeks a year. (laughs) I'm sure insurance will cover some of it, but I'm already emotional right now. Tip, I cannot help you, buddy. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm on. I'm on awesome. uh, yeah, I'm unhelpable. So, yeah. what you talk? You talk like you guys train basically till <clears throat> they break you down and to failure. Mm-hmm. And you talk to these young kids now. How important is it for these kids to experience that adversity, though? Because it seems like you know you were talking about the you know the, the star athlete that is going to get on the field regardless. Coaching sometimes, parenting now, you know, just criticism in general is seem as mm. seemed seems as a negative and it you know i you always gotta learn how to lose too, yeah though. you have, have to, to go through yeah. those lessons in order to get better or get beyond to where you know where you think you're possible so how do you how do you relate that to those athletes today that mm. re- probably don't get that feedback very often uh, it's the first thing i address right because uh, you know w- w- how i all anytime i work with someone i always i always go through a, a, a real subtle inventory on how they perceive their fears how they perceive their talents uh how they perceive their limitations and then ultimately what is their purpose or goal orientation in, in you know obviously in a short term you know front sight 
focus and then long-term downrange uh, uh, probability of success. Um, and I, and I get them to be reflective first on, on what they believe is the sequence of achievement that's required. And you'll, and what, that's what I find that, which is the most distorted right now is, is these young athletes that are out there. And I'm, I witness it. My, my oldest daughter, I have four daughters with John is oldest um, is 13. She is one of the most naturally gifted athletes I I've ever seen. She has a mimic capability that is almost in real time. And, and it's so funny, you know, two years ago, she, she was playing like rec soccer with kids, you know, half her age and they were scoring goals on her. Now she's competitive on probably one of the top, uh, programs in the country and, and, and Boca uh, travel soccer as well. And then her age group, uh, the, 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 the top team, the white team, there's three teams, there's a white, uh, a blue and a red, you know, she's one tryout away from that top team. There are five players on the top team that are on, on the Olympic development team. Mm. And she's been able to gain that much trackings because she can literally mimic how she plays against another player and, and match that play. It's like nothing I've ever seen, mm-hmm. but getting her to recognize, Hey, it, it's, that, that's not the only thing you do in order to get a division one scholarship. You know, I, and you try, I try and use the, the, the statistics, you know, there are 450,000 girls, high school soccer players mm-hmm. and about 1200 division one spots uh, in the top 20, may, maybe they're around there. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, you, you spending five hours on your phone on the weekend and not working out with me and Jonna is, is going to, is not, is going to detri- you know, inhibit you. And so what I'll do instead of, you know, just speaking to a person who can't conceptualize the magnitude of the effort required, I will go out and work out with her and, you know, we'll destroy her and we'll say, you know, do you feel that you feel that's the difference between where you need to be and where it is, you know, and, and we show the physical limitations. And that's what I always suggest to coaches, you know, stop, with these kids, stop trying to intellectualize failure. Mm-hmm. Stop trying to reinforce failure through some positive aspects and 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 generate failure and, and expose limitations so they can't deny it, right? Because mm-hmm. think about it. You, you think about how our educational system is evolving, how youth sports have evolved. Even at the collegiate level, I see it a tremendous amount too. There's there's a certain level of 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 um, a new approach to this, where we're lightening uh, the idea, the ideas of, of of hard pressure, of intense pressure, right? And I and I always use the 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 analogy when I was on my first, uh, it was like my I think it was my first eighty pound team at Boga Jets back in like seventy eight or seventy nine, whenever it was, and and we used to do, remember the old Oklahoma drills, that, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're there, and well, the the coaches were a bunch of good old redneck boys from South Florida, and they would have big chaw, and they would spit in the spot that we would do the, 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 the things and we'd just have to roll around in the spit and they'd be, you know, and they'd be, you know, be like, Rutherford, what do you think you need to do to start? And I'd be like, roll around and dip spit. Cause I'll do it. I just want to play, you know, and you yep. do that now you'd be in jail. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and so what, what, what is your now, what, because it's putting a tremendous amount of pressure on coaches to, to institute failure in, in a positive light because the kids have been per- conditioned that. Um, and then also, you know, their attention spans are, are about this big because of the indoctrination of, of how they're uh, consuming content and mm-hmm. information. Uh, so what I always say is uh, create longer durational exercises within practice that have consistent series of failures that highlight and expose uh, the intensity of their failure, right? And, 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 and actually you can even generate some type of graph that shows the whole team and where they're to reinforce failure is learning as well as uh, this is the standard. This is how you, uh, as- you ascend to uh, through the meritocracy of performance. And, and that way it's undeniable. There's no, there's no euphemism. There's no innuendo. And certainly uh, we need to uh, uh, diminish uh, the, the the significant amount of metaphors we use with these young kids because they, they they don't understand metaphors. Right. I've written down five words so far that I need to look up after this. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's pretty good, though. That's pretty good. I mean, that's I'm only five, and there's been a few, so I, I'm ready to to take to take a look at them. So when I watch some of your videos, though, 
that you have. Mm -hmm. You hammer fear. You've, you already hit the self-confidence thing. You hammer fear. Like we live in it all the time, right? I'm in the sales environment. We've got 20 direct reports here. We talk about numbers and goals all the time, but it's like a fear. Of, it feels fearful sometimes. I heard like an exact comment that you talked about in that with to a big group. I know you do tons of this. You talk to the Red Sox, you talk to everybody. How do you explain the fear to these these people and say like, how do I, how do I switch that around? I'm looking for free advice here to go talk to these people <laughs> the second we get done to this. So like, how do we make it not fearful and more of a game? Because I love competition. I, I crave it. Like I need yeah. it. And that's the way that I take on pressure and fear, right? Like I well, want it to, I want to compete. Well, what's so awesome is in your space, and that's primarily where I do most of my speaking is in the financial world. And, and you know, it's a cutthroat world. I mean, your numbers are posted every day mm -hmm. and they're posted, they're posted, I'm, I'm willing to bet they're posted yeah. like either every half hour or hourly, right? It's, it's the perpetual leaderboard. And, and whereas if you tried to uh, perpetrate that in, in other organizations, you, you know, you, you'd be ostracized immediately because it's, it's, it induces too much stress or fear or whatever. Well, you eat what you kill, man. And, and yep. that's, that's the reality of all, all of our existence and has been for the evolutionary process of over three and a half million years, essentially. And, and just because we have computer systems and Google and, and whatever, doesn't mean that's gone. Uh, it's ridiculous to imagine that. And so it's critical to indoctrinate people into the necessity of a competitive mindset. However, as fear, most people really don't understand fear at all. Um, but yet I'm, you know, nine times out of 10, any fear discussion I get in after a certain amount of time, most people will readily accept that fear is the number one inhibitive factor in our existence. Now, mm -hmm. what you need to do is immediately recognize fear is built around essentially three different spaces. One, it's biological, right? Within your limbic system, you've got your amygdalas, um, and they are the root causation of all fear responses. And, and essentially, this is the oldest component of our brains. It's the most refined component of our brains. It's the most intuitive. And they're actually uh, neural pathways that are built into your, brain, your core uh, neural uh, pathology that, that only uh, uh, serve these fear circuitries, right? And so without cracking your donut open and getting your little ice cream scooper and popping those two suckers out there, you are going to have fear period. And, and people always go, well, you know, were you afraid and, and all this? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I drove around a countryside with 25 million landmines. I was scared to heck, you know, every single, you know, inch I drove, I thought I was going to turn to pig miss for my first, you know, month. I was almost incapacitated with fear to be able to perform. But eventually you, you get to the point, I either do this or, you know, I'm going to get other people killed. Um, and so what you have to recognize is that fear, you're wired for it. And then the other component is you've been taught fear your whole life since mm -hmm. day one, right? Since the first moment out of the womb, uh, you're starting to cry. What do you, you know, what's the cry mechanism? Immediately you get the, uh, the proximal, you know, that, why do you think you can only visualize 11 inches, right? As the space from a breast to an eye, you know, and those are all built in factors. And then we just condition, like, you know, my, my daughters uh, for the last five years, essentially every time I take them to school and drop them off, they have to regurgitate these 22 rules, you know, and, and like rule number three is don't go near strangers. Rule, rule two is safety first. Rule, hell, rule 13 is embrace your fear, right? So we are conditioned from day one, now much less the, the societal norms of where uh, psycho human psychology is being inundated with fear, in particular the last year. And that's why I've been given a talk called Pandemic Motivation, Finding a Pathway Through the Pain for the last year, um, is, is once you've been indoctrinated and essentially your limbic system has been flipped on to this that we refer to as hypervigilance, now, what you're hearing is being overloaded with a, a term called allostatic load, which is you're just, you, you, you can't have any more anxiety, depression, whatever, and fear is what it is, essentially. And then what happens is through that prolonged uh, duration of hypervigilance, and really it's, it's the, the, the just profound amounts of cortisol, epi, norepi, um, you, what you're doing is essentially destroying the neural pathways in your brain uh, with the myelin sheath that, it, that connects the, the, the synapses, right? And that's what helps with the neural conductivity. 
Well, that cortisol just destroys and eats away that. So you become irritable. You what? Are, you you can't sleep. You you lose REM function. Uh, your your body starts to change. You don't process your chemicals. You're not producing enough uh, uh, um, testosterone. I mean, and that's what you know we see now after 20 years of combat. Guys are suffering from what we call operator syndrome, which is this prolonged sensation, this allostatic load, which is having immeasurable ramifications on, on the human experience in its totality. Now, so what I do is once you know you're wired for fear, you've been taught fear your whole life, now what you have to do is, is really begin to seek the truth of what your fear is. And the, like one of the first, in mission one, search for the truth of your fear, it's I ask people to write down every single fear they've ever had that they can remember from their earliest memories. Whether I was uh, afraid of uh, ghosts or I didn't, I didn't like to sleep with the lights on. I'm afraid of snakes or spiders. Uh, I'm afraid of being alone. I'm afraid of uh, being raped. I'm afraid of, uh, you know, just the laundry list of, of fears. And then what, and, and, and when I typically ask if, have you ever done this before? And I remember being in a big audience, about a thousand people. And it was a plumbers association thing. And I, I asked this question, has anybody ever done this before? And I had three people raise their hand and a thousand people. And, and two of the three had done it in a psychology course in, in, in college. And one had done it because their therapist had said, I want you to do this. But the overwhelming majority of people have never spent any time at trying to understand what their fears actually are mm-hmm. and whether or not they're logical or illogical, right? Illogical fears are, are fears that ultimately can lead into personality disorders, phobias, all sorts of things. Whereas logical fears are, are fears that are rooted in, in the natural order of our existence, right? These are triggers that have been in play for tens of thousands of years, if you will. And, and so once you begin to understand the truth, then you learn to accept the reality of your fear by attributing them to a large cross section of people. Because I'll tell you this, man, I've been all over the world and in all different types of situations with all different kinds of people, race, creed, gender, background, religion, doesn't matter. Uh, the, the commonality we all have is, is our suffering. And the extent of which is a derivative of, of how we interpret pain, which is through our fear receptors. And so what I try and get people to do is, is come to a logical explanation of where their root cause initiated, where it comes from, and then to assess it in a real time environment where then they can attack it and begin to retrain their brain around uh, the existence of the fear without being it uh, being a, a paralytic, uh, you know, um, um, infusion into their action, right? Where you can literally, instead of being like on the, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're on a fourth quarter, it's, you know, it's, you know, you're on the five yard line and the ball's going to you. What are you processing in your head? Right. Mm -hmm. Or I'm getting ready to, you know, punch in a door. There potentially Mm -hmm. are 25 terrorists on the inside. If all of a sudden I go, man, I could die instead of, all right, penetrate, sweep right, uh, 11 inches off the wall, clear my sector, make a clear call, engage targets. You know, in, Instead of getting that in play, I allow this other thing to, to, to distract the skill sets that I've put in place, and that's where performance just unravels. And so mm-hmm. that's, those are the three main parts that I really get people to uh, um, deconstruct and understand. And then what we do is we just start building the little pieces back to where it fits in whatever their performance requirements are. We've got work to do. <laughs> We've got, <laughs> I'm going to go listen to that I've, back tonight. I've, I've, <laughs> got work I've, to I've do. known I need, I've, I've known I need to do work for a long yeah. time. Dan's flipped the page three times. I did. <laughs> full notes over here. <laughs> You know what else? So you know did, they, else? did, they, did yeah. they make you do that? Is that where you learn? Like, I because I know buds and with the seals training, there's a lot of classwork too. Is that what that classwork is is about? No, you know, besides no. like you know the guns and you know all that other stuff. But do they teach you that stuff as well? They're starting to teach a little bit of it now. I think they're 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 beginning to because they recognize the the law long effects of, of combat are, are having a pretty consequential. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, we're losing a lot of guys right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, just in the last, uh, last five years, I think I'm, I'm up to uh, eight friends have committed suicide, just lost mm-hmm. another friend last September. Um, amazing guy named Dave Hall, uh, you know, did five years at, at uh, SEAL Team 5, uh, was an instructor with me. That's where I met him. Then he went over to a tier one unit for a long time, got out contracted at the tier one unit, 
got out and just lost mission and, um, you know, and all the effects of operator syndrome and, you know, he, he killed himself last September. And, and so, you know, we're starting to realize, Hey, if you ask a human being to push themselves to such an extent and then don't provide the proper information and education to that individual as to what exactly they're doing to their, uh, their, you know, the entirety of their existence, uh, then there are going to be major ramifications. I look at that NFL player down in South Carolina who just mm-hmm. killed six people. I mean, that, uh, I, I, there's no doubt that when they go in and they look at his brain, I, I guarantee they're going to find a tremendous impact from CTE. Mm-hmm. Uh, for us, it's a little bit different than where the scarring works from the blast wave injuries, but the same things, as well as, you know, this, this complete uh, uh, a bottoming out of identity, right? Yeah. You make this transition, you're on top of the world, you've ascended, you've gotten there. And then all of a sudden you have no idea what your purpose in life is. And, and nobody sat there and taught you how to transition. Um, and so we're, they're doing some work to address it. But for me, you know, my, you know, I took a truckload of, of psychology and philosophy classes in, in, in college and, and read a ton on my own, and then, you know, when I went into the teams, my big thing was I, I didn't want to have, I was, I was aware of the intensity of the program and what it could do to me psychologically. So I, I, I became a medic to kind of balance that out. I wanted to have the duality of being able to take a life and save a life con- con- mm-hmm. in the same context. Where, and I thought that would help me manage the situation. Little did I know that the program is so, so intense uh, that it, it, it sometimes overrides that. And so where I really kind of evolved was when I became an instructor and I, you know, it, it, now it's incumbent upon me to instill uh, a greater perspective on these young frogmen that, hey, you're not just learning how to be a killing machine. Uh, you have to be able to function as a human being uh, as, you know, both in mm-hmm. within the community and then outside of the community with your family or whatever it is. And, and, and maintain the pressures of all this. So that's when I really started getting into the research of all this stuff. And then, and then quite frankly, it was uh, right around the time I started to first work with Paul back in the day. And um, I remember being at a function and they asked, you know, were you afraid? And I thought to myself, what a, what a strange question to ask me, you know, I mean, is it, is it not obvious that a human being would be afraid to be in combat or afraid to be under that type of pressure or that stage? And, and, but it really wasn't the question. It was, you know, what are your thoughts on fear Mm. and where does fear come from and how do you manage it and how do you deal with it? And so I, I dug into fear and, and after about two years of research is really where I was like, wow, this is much more intense. It's much more complicated. And then I, I, I started to build out this program, which has, has been evolving ever since. And you said something, I heard another one that you said, and this is part of like the, you know, tying it back to like a little bit of the team life thing. You talked about team life and it's like, you asked a group of people, like who's he, who here has done it by themselves? Who here has done it on their own? Like some people might think that, but like the truth is like, that's nobody has. Like nobody has done it by themselves, and that was a, that was a talk. I can't remember what one it was, but you're giving to people, and I, I'm sure that like as people are younger, they're like, "Yeah, I did it on my own. Like nobody helped me through this." But that's just not logical, right? And and you had a Nowhere good talk near on that. It. You yeah. know, eat, I mean, think about all the guys you remember. My my favorite were always the the hard cases, the stories of the kids that were on your teams or that were on my teams that came from nothing, right? Mm-hmm. That they they lived in broken homes, they were beaten as kids, their kid their parents were drug addicts, or you know. And I had there's tons of those guys in the teams, just just debilitating childhoods, and we're beginning to start to see a correlation of of the individual that struggles afterwards and as it relates to the intensity of trauma they faced as a child. And so, because what happens is, is you're exposed to those hardships and you create a formula for coping, which te- has a, a, a profound um, tendency to be affiliated with team, 
with a particular type of team that gives you purpose and sensation mm-hmm. and value. And that's why young kids go into gangs or they, you know, they become criminals or whatever it is. Or, and then other kids join teams or whatever it might be. We're all looking for that group. It's built into the construct of, of the human condition. We, we need to be affiliated with each other in some capacity. And so what happens is you go through this experience, you develop these skill sets, and then all of a sudden you're away from that. And now you're isolated and you don't know how to build other teams because when you join a team, it's already pre-made. It's there. They're the, the conditions, the rules, the mm-hmm. construct of, of, of how we interact is there. There's a, a, a stated mission. There's sub, there's a, a sub stated reality within the skill sets required for you to have a role in that. And so it's really beginning to understand all that. But when you stripped of that team, man, you're, you're done. And that's why for me, you know, after fear, you know, once you get the fear, then it's self-confidence. And then you're right. I I go and I teach people the importance of a a team oriented mindset and what that looks through some pretty strategic definitions. Right. And the number one definition I start with is how do you define commitment? How do you define it to yourself? And then how do you define it to your teammates? Right. Because a lot of times, we don't struggle with being our commitment to ourselves. We we've got that down. It's 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 rooted in our construct of, of survivability and in our mm-hmm. capabilities, and then and then discomfort and pain. But when, when the real challenge is, how do you define commitment to some other human being to make sure they succeed? And and really, sport, in my opinion, uh, is probably. Uh, the number one way to teach this that of anything there is in the world, the most positive attribute to teach team orientation is actually to be a part of a sports team. Yep. Or even if you're doing e- esports gaming teams now mm-hmm. is huge. And you're, you're seeing this whole new population of kids that were once put off to the side because of whatever, uh, you know, whatever reason or whatever classification, you know, you, you know, young kids like to, to, to disseminate into now they have their own teams and there's a, a viable way to be part of teams there. So yeah, the team life is absolutely a, a formidable uh, thing. Once you accept the valuation as opposed to individuality, even if it's negative, because I, you know, my favorite are, are fighters, right? UFC fighters, I've worked with a few of them, uh, you know, other fighters and, and the sensation that you're, yes, you are stepping into the ring and you're going to get in a fight, which is a, is a yeah. debilitating fear. In wild and itself, wild right? mindset. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. I'm going to, and I'm not going in the ring facing some chump. I'm going in the ring yeah. facing somebody who's highly trained professional. Mm-hmm. And if I'm not on my A game, one strike could kill me instantaneously. And so, but, you know, there's no better moment for me than right before they go and, you know, they, they're doing, they, you know, check the cup and, you know, mouthpiece and all that. The first thing that happens is they immediately turn around and they embrace this group of people that have been with them on this debilitating journey of, of literal, literal pain that, that has just, you know, cause I mean, think about it every day you're fighting to fight. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's a phenomenon that I, it's just amazing. And and they turn around, they embrace, and it gives them the strength to walk in that ring. And I, and we all need that. And we all need to focus on cr- creating better teams through our own selflessness first and foremost. Have, how would you, how, and you probably had a few instances of this come up, but you know, Dante Scarnecchia, a long time offensive line coach <clears throat> used to say to us a lot, you can have a bad day, but you can't have one on Sunday. <laughs> right. And I'm sure you going into a mission that's live, um, you know, that was kind of the same philosophy, but you know, you want to be, you want to practice perfect. So you got mm-hmm. a teammate or yourself, you know, I've had bad days on the practice field as well. How do you handle that in that type of setting with the seals when the mission is so, you know, so dire? So there's multiple ways that we can address it, right? Um, f- first and foremost, you have to look at the 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 nuance of the particular skill set that they're missing on, right? Is it body position on a block? Is it that they just they they don't know what the people to the right, the left, the front, and back of them are doing? They don't have the grand uh, field sense, right? And many times that's the case. People are. are so if they make a mistake within the, the their own individual actions that it 
precludes them from keeping that battlefield perspective or field sense, right? Or, mm-hmm. or understanding like tip, you know, you, you know, you're, you're, you're down in account, you've got a runner on, on second and third, you know, the, all of those things, the particular batter it is, what, you know, where they've hit, yeah, what double the, in, you know, double what, in the gap and all of that is relevant. And so what happens under the duress of, of true pressure is we want to, drill down as much as humanly possible to one particular skill set. And that's all we want to be responsible for. Well, as we all know, that's, that's not, it's not okay. Right. So what I would do is I'll take the individual away from the group, you know, let them go in, move them away from the group, drill down the skill set again, right. Over and over and over, do it 10, 15, 20 times, whatever it takes to where they, they can uh, work through whatever the deficiency, their toe isn't pointed, right. Their shoulder is in head, their hands aren't up, whatever it might be. Um, you know, get that to a place where like, all right, did you feel that? Yeah. All right. Do it again. Did you feel it again? Yeah. Do it again. Did you feel it again? Mm-hmm. You know, generally three, three cycles, right. Three, do it, do it as, as close to perfection as possible three times that ingrains the level of confidence, then build them back in. But before going back on the field, give them a little oversight. All right, now let's put your skill set, uh, uh, um, um, remedi- remediation, we call it, your skill set remediation back in the content before you step on a field, back into the construct of the overall experience, the overall mission. Tell me what the guy to the left of you does. Tell me what the guy right of you does. Tell me what the guy behind you does. Tell me what the mission orientation is about. And if they get all that right, you're good. If they don't, now you've been able to separate uh, the, in in general terms, the two most significant issues that are playing a role in performance, right? Which is, have they gotten close to perfection on the individual skill set? And are they able to have uh, a, a specific understanding of the overall mission itself? Okay, Bud's training. I have a Bud's training question. <laughs> we're, we're going for a softball right now. <laughs> Our Gatorade question just is like, I'm like really I'm, low I'm, for yeah, this, I'm, I'm this like, conversation. I'm like sweating right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, toughest part of Bud's training. Is it the mud flat thing? You see that video, you see like the mud flats, like people are in like up to their neck and like the mud, they're covered in mud. I don't um, know where I'm it gonna, takes I'm going to put but... my bed, trying to land that raft on, on uh, the rocks. Rock forage. Yeah. Oh, is that, that, is that, that what it's called? I, I, that's well, what I'm going to ask him. I mean, so what, what was the toughest that part of it? Just so like, both, 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 these are great questions by the way. And that's the number one thing everybody wants to know. What's the hardest part about buds. Mm-hmm. And so let me, I'll, I'll condense it first and then we'll bring mm-hmm. it out larger. Um, so nothing compares to hell week, nothing whatsoever. And for your listeners who don't know what hell week is, is we start on a Sunday afternoon once the sun goes down, we have this four hour breakout session where fake, you know, machine guns are going off and flake, fake flashbangs and grenades and they're hitting the surf and they're getting a, a, just a co- comprehensive beat down, you know, wet, sandy push ups, eight count bodybuilders, burpees, just pummeled for four straight hours, mass chaos. And then that continues until Friday afternoon. Um, and so <laughs> you, what, what you week go- is that? Uh, now it's in the sixth week of training. When I went through, it was the fifth, fourth week of training. Okay. So now it's, they've extended it to the, to to the sixth week. Cause so you can have the, they found that the two additional weeks gave a a little better acclimatization to the cold water, which is, is the killer for all people mostly. Um, so, you know, your first sleep is Thursday morning. And, and so that's oh. a 90 to 96 hour stretch of no sleep at all. I mean, obviously by, by the 40 some out, mind you, we're, we have a 200 pound boat on our head co- around the clock where we're, we, you run about 200 total miles during hell week. Uh, you're, uh, you're submerged in the water. It's something like it's like, it's like 16 total hours or something. Plus you're doing O courses and scavenger hunts, steel piers, all these little things. You paddle all the way around went late, late, early Thursday morning, you paddle all the way around, uh, uh, Coronado Island from one's the beach side all the way around. It's just, it's just crazy. That's where things really got bizarre for me. That's where I had hit pretty comprehensive, um, cognitive disassociation where I started to see, I saw, um, a Volkswagen uh, bug driving down the middle 
of San Diego Harbor. So <laughs> that gives me an idea. So, so the, the challenge is really, and, and for each guy, it hits them at a different point from what I've been able to, to gather. Uh, at, at one particular point or several, like I thought about quitting almost constantly through it. It was so debilitating. Um, most guys were like, I never thought about quitting. I was like, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> but, but my pinnacle point came on Wednesday night. Um, we hit this thing where we had to do surf passage for several hours, but it was it was an El Nino year, and we had the largest surf we had had in, in like 10 years. It was like thir- 25, 30 foot. And so we were paddling out and our boats were just, it was a, just a a yard sail for almost a mile and a half down the beach. And, you know, when you get thrown out of a boat and you're in the top of the boat at, at, on a 25 foot wave and you're falling in the thing and then the boat's going to collapse on your head and potentially drown you. Or then the next, you know, five waves of a 20 foot set drive you to the bottom. That's a little nerve wracking. And so when they get you out of the water and they're like, all right, ladies, get back in your boats and go out. You can, suspect a lot of people mm-hmm. are hammered. Well, we finished that and they did this thing called chief's beach where they build this bonfire and it, it, you're just on the outside. So you can kind of feel the the heat. But the, the thing was that if you got up next to the bonfire, you told the funniest story you've ever told in your life. And if, if, if everybody laughed and the instructors laughed, you could stay there till the next guy tells <laughs> his story until someone bumps you out. Well, luckily me being the storyteller that I am, I told a doozy from college that involved a, <laughs> a, a strobe light, a big bad wolf mask, uh, a shotgun, and and a friend, and <laughs> and so it sounds like uh, a title that, of a book in the future. <laughs> <laughs> that that story was it was great. So I lasted about six guys. So mind you, now I'm close to the fire, and for the first time, I can feel my face, my lips, my hands. I can feel my. I actually started feeling my feet, my toes for the first time in four days. Um, and I, my, my clothes are actually dry. I hadn't seen dry, worn dry clothes and forever. And, and like, I'm, I got comfortable. And then, then someone came up, told a funnier story. I, I was like, ah, ha, ha. And the instructor looked at me and goes, what are you laughing at? Rut go hit the surf zone. Ugh. And that cracked me a little bit. And from there, not much longer, we were put in the surf for what's called surf torture where we lock arms and now these waves are just destroying us. And, and someone, uh, we had, it was the weekend, I think the second weekend that uh, Braveheart had been out. And so one of our instructors was screaming at us how much we stunk and we were horrible, the worst class in Bud's history. And, and our, uh, one of our officers, who's a guy who's still in a team, who so will be Admiral one of the day, one of the greatest officers, greatest dudes I've ever met, uh, s- screams out freedom, <laughs> right? And, and they just lost it. And they're like, that's it. We're going to beat the hell out of you. Forget it. You guys are done. We're going to make everybody quit. This is going to be a, a no class, hell week class. And, and I remember going, I can't do this. I'm done. And I looked at my boat crew leader who I was next to. And I said, Hey man, I'm, I'm out. I'm, I'm done. And he's like, you're not going anywhere. He goes, there's no way you're leaving. Uh, you know, this is, this is your deal. And, 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 you know, he actually was like, you know, today's your birthday. You're not going anywhere. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I was like, Roger that. And, (laughs) you know, and that got me through that evolution to get to the next one. And, you know, in my boat crew, I I had Rob O'Neill was in my boat crew, a guy shot bin Laden, Mm -hmm. uh, three other guys in my boat crew were all members of, of seal team six. I mean, they were pipe hitters, a couple other dudes, you know, were great operators went on combat tours, worked for the agency like I did. And my boat crew leader went on, you know, he's one of the top guys in hostage rescue at the FBI right now. So I'm, I'm surrounded by these caliber of individuals that as soon as I got out of my own head and invested back in them to be the motivator, to be the guy to say, then that was my driver. If I got lost in my head, I, I immediately turned to someone I thought was struggling and try and redirect my anxiety, my negativity into a positive frame of mind and lift them up. And that did it. And that got me through. So how weak by far, but in the greater context, it's, it's the moment, any moment within training when the individual has lost sight of that, it's a, a, a collective effort and it's not individual. Mm, that, so what, has there ever, ever been a no class class? Has that happened? Yeah. Yeah. I think one, wow. there's been one no class. Yeah. Hell week class there. We had a class just uh, two years ago that only 13 guys made it through hell week. How, how many people yeah, start, how many, yeah, how many people start, start that? 
usually now there's only five classes you know uh so i think it's anywhere from like 200 to 225 people every class yep. um Ooh. and you're graduating 40 to 60 usually is kind of mm-hmm. the thing but dep- it, but here's the deal it's all dependent upon how cold it is mm-hmm. all the data proves that the colder the hell week the yep. little or the class wow yeah that's some intense stuff for yeah. sure how do you so, how do you how do you get ready for that coming out of college how do you how do you get ready I don't for think that you do that you don't get ready right <laughs> I mean, no you can't. I, I don't know if you can i mean that's the, that's the ultimate question dan and that's what we literally have had every single <laughs> incredible organization that studies performance come out there and and want to study us right from upenn's performance lab stanford mm-hmm. northwestern you know Harvard, everybody's come out to study you know how do you make it through that and and the way I boil it down to is is it, it's the individual that that submits that submits mm-hmm. to a place more so emotionally than intellectually, right? Because in our intellectual reality is much different than our emotional reality. And so the person who submits to the fact that they don't control their own reality. And that within that, if you allow this, these other people, most importantly, the people that are around you experiencing some context of similar pain, right? Mm -hmm. You know that they're getting the beat down too. They're in the cold just as long as you can. You're in the, so there's a relative um, uh, baseline of experience. And so if you accept that in the moment, that is your reality. There's, I don't need to concentrate on anything further out or behind me, especially behind me, those, those, that kind of retractive thinking on an emotional level is, is utterly destructive when it comes to performance. And so if I can just sit here and a lot of guys will say, they just focus on, on getting to the next meal, just get to the next meal, get to the next meal, get for me, I whittled it down even more focus on the individual order. That's it. So if if an instructor came to me and all right, boat crew two, uh, drop down and give me, you know, 20 perfect pushups. All I'm thinking about is 20 perfect pushups. That's it. Mm -hmm. And then I, as I'm sitting there and we're in the leaning rest for 20, 30, 40 minutes, or, you know, we're in the half squat with the boats on our heads, you know, and you're, you're just on fire. I'm not, I, I, I just think about the exactitude of the order I just received. And that enables me to be submissive in that moment aware emotionally of the other guys around me, garner strength from that, and then just, you know, take a baby step and Mm -hmm. take a baby step. Because as soon as I come out of that and I start to reflect on uh, my past experience of, of, of my interpretation of discomfort, which is always de minimis in comparison to what we actually can do. And you guys, I'm sure Mm -hmm. can attest to that in multiple ways throughout your careers. Um, you know, that's what is destructive. But if you can stay in the moment, I mean, tip, how many times did coaches tell you just forget about everything else on the mound? You got to clear the mechanism, there. clear the mechanism. You got to do that's like the what's the movie? I can't remember, but Kevin no, Costner, no, no, it's, uh, Kevin Costner. Yeah. For love of the game. For love of the that game. That was his yeah. big thing. It was clear the mechanism. Well, but the that's, other thing is, that's what a lot of people try to do. It's like, this, you know, zoning in like just on the catcher's mitt, right? Or like zoning in on anything other than like the person that's like you know yelling at you and saying that you're fat out there or whatever right yeah. it's just like honing in on one tiny thing and if you focus on those past things or the past mistakes that you made it's just going to lead to more mistakes yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. absolutely i knew we have a couple of member guests coming up for golf <laughs> dan and i we're gonna put you in the golf cart with us <laughs> I, feel, I feel like if he was with us in the golf cart I dude, might, we might I not might, be beat. yeah i might stay on point we might not be beat. we'll be I, so la- this, laser yeah. focused <laughs> I'll tell you this, the, the, the first probably four or five days with me is, is, is a little unbearable. Uh, cause what well, I we spent a couple down, with you, I spent a couple with you. <laughs> well, yeah. we really drill down, you know, what I try and do is I, you know, we, we, you know, we, we, after we can, after you, after we get a, an individual to who can legitimately and logically articulate what they believe their potentiality is based on factual data from prior experience, then we start. And where we start is we start dissecting every aspect of their performance, everything, right? Let's, let's get mm-hmm. into 
every detail. And let's evaluate. Is it addressed or doesn't? Does it need to be addressed or doesn't? Does your nutrition, what kind of nutrition are you putting in? Uh, how does your warm up? What's your warm up look like? You know, how do you prepare? What are you saying to yourself five minutes before you go on? What, what kind of warm up do you like? I worked with this, uh, um, you know, tennis phenom for a little bit and we took her from, uh, when she came to me, she was 13 years old. And her, I remember her dad talked to me and she was like, I want you, I want a Navy SEAL. I want you to tie her up and throw her in the pool and, <laughs> and, and beat the snot out of her. And I'm like, whoa, 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 Ann Hall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's not going to do her any good. Right. Right. So what we started was, was, you know, when she was, she was about 375 or something in juniors, we got her up to about 28, rank 28. And, and it was really about, um, once she was on and playing, her skill sets were good enough, right? She was good and she was a competitor no matter what. She was so fast. She had great lateral movement. She knew where to ball. She had patience, but she also could attack when she needed. So really where her two spots were, were uh, leading up and what she did first and foremost. And we discovered her diet was atrocial day of, night before. She wasn't hydrating effectively. She wasn't stretching. She wasn't doing anything to the back pain she had. You know, So we just cleaned all that up. Then we created a, a, a sleep routine of getting into bed in the appropriate way through great visualization, meditation, and some other facets and hydration. Um, and then, uh, you know, right prior to stepping on the court, giving her a 20-minute program to just work through there. And that just that priming alone put her in a much more confident space. And then on a, on a, just on a, on a micro level, when she would hit a, a, a hiccup, uh, she had this uh, real significant connection to her grandparents and her grandmother in particular, who gave her this necklace that she would wear plain. So I would say, all right, you, you hit a bad shot, you get frustrated, you're doing something, you know, just turn around, walk away, take that necklace and just rub that necklace a couple times. And we gave her a mantra to work on and just get back in as just an interruptive measure, right? Mm -hmm. Just to break mm -hmm. contact with that pressure reset and then get back in to steady your mind. And, and we had great success with it. So, you know, what, what we, what I like to do is, is really, cause man, this is the, this is the challenge for all coaches and, and every player is wonderfully unique, right? You, you, you both have these mm -hmm. incredible attributes that somewhere somebody saw them and like, my God, we need that piece for our big puzzle. And so what we, what, 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 what sometimes coaches want to do is they want to alter the, the, the strengths of the individual in terms of their performance. And, and, and you're like, well, wait a minute, mm -hmm. you know, do you really need that? You have three other players that can give you that. This person is really that gives you that one exceptional thing that you have, right? That no one else on the team. So let's, let's just focus on that. And if there's some behavioral or emotional things, we'll clean that stuff up, but let's really figure out where that fits in the best way and not try and destroy that. Cause that person, and this is the thing that that's the tough pill to swallow for coaches. That person has spent so much time, <laughs> so much dedication to developing those particular skill sets unique to them. Why would you want to, take that away. Right. It just baffles yeah. me. And, just, and I see it all the time. And it's just like, listen, you know, uh, there are very few people that can be the, the, the outliers. And when you get one, man, you're like, good God. I mean, Dan, you can speak to that. Uh, you, yeah, you played yeah. with probably the greatest outlier that's ever graced the field of, of any kind. I think, you know, you could make an argument for Jordan, you know, you probably could make uh, some type of Gretzky. Yeah, you yeah. Know, uh, Gretzky Muhammad was Ali, a free. All that stuff. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. But he, so, sixth round, you know, probably can't run out of sight in two weeks, that type of guy. But he transformed so many people around him that he just mm -hmm. has that. Yeah, he has the arm strength of, you know, he can put the, put the, throw a dime, yep. you know, drop it in the bucket, whatever mm -hmm. you want to say. But how he can elevate everybody around him is that that quality that you can't teach and someone's just got a spot and pick them, you know, 199 overall. But what yep. you're saying there is Belichick into a T it's just, Hey, let's find out what you do great. And then I'll find a spot for you in the system that you can help us most. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, the, the and, comment, the quote in like the Brady six was from Mar Steve Mariucci, I think said, we looked at everything with everybody, right? Like in the combines, but you couldn't like tear somebody open and look at their heart. 
That's what they said about Brady. And I was, no. Hang on, my heart's going there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting my heartbeat going right now. But that's like a true thing. You know, like you can't tear somebody open and look at their heart. And it was, it well, was you're incredible. Gonna, you're going to find out their heart and buds. I guarantee you that. Though. Yeah, that's you, true. You don't need to rip that's, it open. That's true. Well, uh, and it's designed for that. So, I, you know, Tip, I would suggest that you can. Uh, mm. It's a question of, of can do and can't do. I mean, I, I, I get all the time. I get these companies and say, oh, we want to become the Navy SEALs of whatever. And I'm like, all right, well, all right, I'm going to bring in a rubber boat and I'm going to, you know, get everybody wet and sandy and beat the snot out of them for 24 hours, straight hours. And they're like, well, HR wouldn't like that. We'd be, uh, you know, we'd be sued. And I said, well, then you don't want to be the Navy SEAL because yeah. what you want is just a high performing team. That's yeah. a whole different thing. Right. I mean, Navy SEALs, yeah, we are really good at what we do, but have you ever seen us out socially or around other people? We're like social hand grenades, man. We're not, we, we don't function well in typical so- society. We, we have many issues with relationships. We, we don't play nice with others. Uh, and, and it's because we've been indoctrinated into a, a, a mindset of violence that is, is, is dedicated to one specific area and place in the world and one thing. And that's not what you want. Want, right. You, yeah. you yeah. want to be able to find those skill sets and, and, and integrate that into an overall mission that that is a clear mission. And I think that's really where you see the best coaches out there. The greatest leaders is they have a very clear mission of of what um, the what the culture of the team is. Mm. And that's the, that's the, that's where the magic happens is you, you recruit players or for that can fit into the culture that you've built out. And, and that's, what's so challenging for, you know, most coaches on the professional level, you come in and if you're not winning within two years, man, you're out the right. door. And that's, that's just madness to me. Yep. Um, but it's, it's the business of the game. And unfortunately it is what it is. So, you know, in terms of every other place, collegiate, high school, Pop Warner, whatever, focus on the culture of the team, set those standards, and then find those strengths and then fit those in, like you said, Dan. We're bringing him in to talk to the squad locker team. I I think you should. Absolutely. (laughs) I mean, this is good enough to move this to Gary, the CEO, and you got to come on his podcast too. You too would be that max you got to set that one up. That's going to be an incredible conversation for you guys. But how do we? Well, you can ask. If you want, I mean, the stupid question that we usually do just because oh, I will. Some, sometimes we're stupid. No, but I, I, we're, will. I, I just got to tell you, it was an honor to talk to you and yeah, to huge. meet you. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you so much for your service and your sacrifice mm-hmm. and to hear about your buddies that you've lost uh, very recently. Mm. Um, I'm so sorry. And, you know, if there's anything that we can do, um, anything that you're fighting for, uh, anything that you're involved, uh, please don't hesitate to, you know, tell us, tell the viewers, yeah. um, you know, we just want to help. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Dan. It's a, we're, we're living in a, a very challenging world and, and we're getting ready to, you know, uh, hit our, this is the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Um, and over the next three to five years, we're going to have a wave of people that we, I affectionately refer to as the 9-11 babies, people that came in post 9-11 to serve their country. Uh, they're mm-hmm. getting out after 20 years and they've had 20 years, of, almost 20 years of sustained combat. And so we're expecting this tidal wave of, of challenges. And, and if anybody wants, they can go to my website at teamfroglogic.com. And I've got a paper there called operator syndrome and operator syndrome li- lays out all of the dis- different medical challenges that guys with prolonged uh, exposure to combat and, and training uh, are going through in many cases. And, and it's a, it's a big ordeal. And, you know, we're, we're currently trying to figure out uh, a place to uh, really, we're develop myself and the guy who wrote the paper, a guy named Dr. Chris Free. Uh, we're trying to, we're starting a nonprofit called Operator Syndrome. We're building a curriculum for operators and healthcare providers uh, to come to and take um, and then what we want to do is partner. There's a, a very, there's like 46,000 veterans charities out there. Only about 20,000 of them are actually gold rated, which means 70 cents or more goes mm-hmm. to the vet, but very few, you know, like 0.01% of those actually have legitimate medical programs that can assess the totality of operator syndrome. You know, the home base up at Mass General that the Red Sox are involved with is a, is a really good program. They're doing great things. 
uh, the Shepherdsman uh, Foundation, which is out of the Shepherd Brain Clinic in Atlanta. They're doing great work. And then the Synchrony Program out of Methodist Hospital um, down in um, Houston uh, are really the only ones that are, are, are getting on board with the concept of operator syndrome and, and the totality and difficulties and complexities it takes to treat treat us. So, And, and you've got the podcast too, though. Frog, frog logic are you still like do you have that i mean i listen I to tons of those yeah, and you've done some different podcast. stuff yeah so find him there as well i mean yep. visit the site any other any other spots you know that, that anybody uh, should try to find you uh you know i i i came off uh social media i needed a break um also uh kind of uh got a, a little bit of uh, uh censorship going on mm-hmm. i don't know why i've never posted anything politically I, I don't do anything like that i try not to be divisive in any way shape or form because it's the first way that destroys us you know um mm-hmm. um but i you know it happened and so I, i've been taking a break i'm on linkedin and so i post on linkedin every now and then still it seems like one of the last bastions of of place where people <laughs> aren't fo- fixated on all the divisiveness of our unfortunate uh situation um uh, but uh you know my website teamfroglogic.com mm-hmm. or you can if, you, if you're interested in the embrace fear program training program you can go to the frog logic institute uh, we started and we're going to be releasing the Embrace Fear. We're about two months away from the self-confidence. Then we're going to do a team life course. We're doing operator syndrome in the summer. And then uh, uh, the last component of frog logic thinking, which is uh, live with purpose. And be ready uh, to have a thesaurus out for some of the words on your on your LinkedIn post. I, I might usually have to have it right out beside me like what's uh, like or actually a dictionary not a thesaurus I mean like really yeah, I, gotta, I have dictionary. to understand both anything that I can and understand what you're talking key. about there, there you know? is a five year catalog of, of, of daily doses of frog logic that I would write pretty religiously for the last five and a half or so years on Instagram and my it's still there I'm just not active and it's at team frog logic and there's just hundreds of those yeah. there if you if you need some motivation. So nice. Last last thing, um, and I'm probably going to switch to whatever your answer is right here. <laughs> we ask everybody this, right? So we ask them, you know, what what flavor Gatorade do you like the best? What so color, we ask all color, of our athletes, what color, what, what color Gatorade do you like the best? Well, what, what would you guys guess that I like uh, best? I think that you're red, yeah. like all day, I and I'm red. yellow. I'm a yellow. Okay. I'm a yellow person. I'm a red. Dan's red. What's your? I'm the original baby. I'm red. I'm the green. I'm oh, okay, just... good. All right, so he's mine. He's the green. Yeah, yeah, he's green yellow. Yeah, original. yeah, green yellow. That's the original. That's the green original. yellow. It's yellow. It's <laughs> well, lemon we, I call it yellow. Yeah, so green. Green, we're the green, same. All right, green, yellow, good. yellow. I'm gonna have to think yellow, of another yellow, word for green. Okay, okay good. That's, that's what I thought. We, and we at this household here, you know, with John is blue. Uh, uh, Chloe is in between blue and orange. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm I'm yellow. Uh, the younger ones haven't made it in there, but we get the big ones with the scoopers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah. old school. It's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Going straight I to like the that. going straight to I the like concentrate. That. I love it. <laughs> we'll dry powder mix. We need the double dose, man. Yeah. Check out Rot on anywhere, anywhere you can find him. Go watch his YouTube videos. Go watch anything because it's awesome. And I'm going to listen to this one back fast. Yeah. So, and we will find you soon, sir. We'll come down. We'll have a beer. You come up here. We'll have a beer. We'll 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 get together and do this. I'm excited for uh, it, I, I, gentlemen. I, you know, it's. Man, with 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 where things are going, it's so refreshing to to come on with uh, guys like you. I have such admiration and respect because both of you ascended to a place that I had dreamed of my entire life, and so I, I have as equal amount of respect for you guys. And 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 just thank you for allowing me to come in and participate in something that is really positive. Uh, we we mm-hmm. need more shows like yours. We need more people out there just you know, giving people something else to think about and th- things that will improve their lives. And I just can't thank you guys enough. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in hey, person sometime. You got it. Absolutely. Thanks, Appreciate it. Fast Our Prime is brought to you by Squad Locker. Squad Locker is your one-stop shop for custom team apparel delivered right to your front door. Learn more by visiting squadlocker.com.